In the early 20th century, a city planner by the name of Robert Moses was responsible for the construction of most of the infrastructure in and around New York City, including the New York State Thruway System, bridges between Long Island and Manhattan, Staten Island and Manhattan. Robert Moses, at one point, controlled over a third of all public funds flowing into the state of New York, despite never holding an elected position. He built hundreds of parks throughout New York City. He built highways, uh, playgrounds, just about everything that you see. His engineering at scale turned New York into a world-class city in the uh, early 20th century, in the new industrial revolution, led in part by the development of the automobile as a mode of transportation. His name still adorns many parks, schools, pieces of public work in New York City today. Robert Moses was also a noted racist. When he built the Cross Bronx Expressway, he had two options, known as the one mile. The first option would have jogged south to run along the north end of Cortana Park. Instead, he chose to build it a little bit to the north along East 74th Street. In doing so, he destroyed the homes of thousands of Jewish people, an unnecessary move that contributed nothing to the efficacy of this roadway. When he built playgrounds, he built playgrounds all around New York City. Only one of them was in what was then a black neighborhood of Harlem. In these parks, he built elaborate wrought iron fences. In this one park in the black neighborhood, the fence was adorned with monkeys, something that is still there today. In Long Island, he knew that the laws would prohibit the use of the throughways by buses, trucks, and large vehicles. But he said that laws can be changed at the whim of the legislature. Bridges are much harder to tear down. As a result, to this day, some 80 years later, there are something like 174 bridges over the Long Island Expressway with nothing more than a three-meter clearance preventing buses from New York City, from taking people who live in poorer neighborhoods, mostly black, Jewish, and immigrant communities, from accessing Jones Beach in Long Island. This was a deliberate move on his part. I bring this up because New York City is a city that believes itself to be peak in its exceptionalism. If you ever talk to somebody from New York, if you ever engage with somebody from New York, they are immensely proud of their city. They believe it is the best in the world. I don't agree. But that exceptionalism, that belief that we are being the best, that belief that they have, that they live in the best city in the world, is something that we see in our communities and technology over and over. We are building the best things. We are disrupting. We can improve our food delivery service. We can improve the way that we talk to our friends and our family. We can improve the way that we drive. We can make things smarter, faster, cheaper. And that attitude that we have causes, should cause us to reflect on what are the decisions that we make when we build these things. Robert Moses came to my attention because one of my professors at my alma mater, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York, uh, Langdon Winner wrote a paper in 1980 called Do Artifacts Have Politics? And in this paper he says, he, he brings up two instances in which an engineered system can be considered to be imbued with political properties. The first, he says, are instances in which the invention, design, or arrangement of a specific, specific technical device or system becomes a way of settling an issue in a particular community. Second, he says, are cases of what can be called inherently political technologies, man-made systems that appear to require or to be strongly compatible with particular kinds of political relationships. 
Now this article was written almost 40 years ago, and when he wrote it, he was talking about things like bridges, things that are physical engineered systems that interact with our world. But we can look at this now in the way that we build software and systems. What are the software and systems that we have that are imbued with particular kinds of political relationships? What are the immutable truths of software that we have today? Of course, we're all familiar with this company. We might even use their technology. We may opt out of being a member of Facebook or a user of Facebook, but it is nearly impossible to go through our day-to-day -day lives without interacting with React or some other technology that they've built or even just using a website whose login um, uses Facebook for authentication. So we could look at Facebook, or as they are now known, Facebook, um, as an example of an intractable political technology. My name is Emily Gorsunsky. I am a data scientist at a company called ThoughtWorks. Um, I put this here because uh, my company is gracious enough to host me for uh, having this talk and coming here to discuss technology with you all. But I also put this here because although these are opinions that are shared only by me and not my employer, um, ThoughtWorks is a company that has a, a set of values that are often in tension. All of our companies, we all have values. Th some of ThoughtWorks' values are technological excellence that believe in exceptionalism of using cool cutting edge technology, doing things with AI and machine learning and augmented reality. And we also have a core value, a core pillar of social and economic justice. And sometimes our values are in tension. And these discussions that we have, this exploration of what we do, is how we resolve those things. And I've been thinking about this for a long time because even though I'm a data scientist and there are some certainly tricky issues with that, I was actually um, somebody that was trained as an aeronautical and mechanical engineer. And for eight years, I worked in the biotechnology industry doing medical research on human subjects and as a defense contractor building weapons, including planes that flew across the ocean to drop bombs on people. Some work that I'm not proud of. The patterns that we have seen with how systems were engineered in the 20th century will repeat themselves as we start to build new types of technologies, as we start to build platforms at scale, as we start to in integrate the internet in our normal devices. Some of you might be familiar with Theorac 25. Raise your hand if you know what this is. Okay, a couple people have raised their hands. All of you should know what Theorac 25 is because it's a historical thing. It's one of the first times in history that software killed somebody. Theorac 25 was an electron beam radiation therapy machine. It was built in the 1970s and used throughout the US and Canada in the 1980s. And over a period of three or four years in the 80s, there were six incidents of what is called an, a radiation beam overdose. Essentially, this device is supposed to shoot a beam of radiation at a specific point in somebody's body um, with the intention of very specifically targeting a tumor or a cancerous growth or something and um, killing it. That radiation beam is um, very powerful and has to be quite well calibrated. And in a handful of incidents, it was way, way, way too powerful. And four people died from this. In the ensuing investigation as to what happened, they found that it was a result of a software failure. And if you've learned about Theorac 25, you might have heard it in presented as bad software caused a fatality. But that's actually not true. The software was, for the time that it was written, um, written to acceptable, more or less acceptable software engineering patterns. But when they did the investigation, what they found was that there were a few things um, that raised red flags. For example, they ported from an earlier version of the Theorac machine, they ported PDP-9 code to PDP-11 code. And there became a race condition that was um, ingested or inserted into this code that if you hit a certain sequence of keys with a specific timing in response to a specific error message or a, a specific error alert that did not contain a useful message, <coughs> a hardware interlock would not engage, and the radiation beam that was generated would be much, much more powerful. 
In the aftermath of the Iraq 25, the American Food and Drug Administration and the Medical Device Directorate, along with the European uh, Central um, Authority for, that regulates medical devices, came up with a series of software standards for how medical device software is written. And now, if you want to create a smart medical device, for example, a smart prosthetic, a smart heart rate monitor, or something like that, you have to adhere to these standards. We're starting to see this now. Of course, everyone's talking about Elon Musk and Tesla, right? Tesla's innovative because what are they doing? They're building a, a car around a computer, not putting a computer into a car. And we have all of these other companies um, that are starting to integrate self-driving technology. This is an Uber vehicle, it's a Volvo, um, that Uber was using. This vehicle is famous, does anyone know why? It's got collision damage. That collision damage is because it hit and killed a pedestrian in Tempe, Arizona last year. And just yesterday, a report came out that said that the radar system on this vehicle detected the pedestrian, but the algorithms that they put into it didn't account for the principle, for the idea that a pedestrian might possibly be jaywalking. So this vehicle killed somebody, and now we are in a world where there have been multiple fatalities from vehicles that were operating in a level four uh, or higher autonomous mode. So we're engaging, we're entering a world in which we're putting technology, algorithms, and the internet into physical systems. We have the internet in all of our cars now. We can ship software over the air to update software in cars. We're engaging in this world, and this is going to have lethal effects. So the question is, what do we need to do as software engineers to learn from these other industries that have had to deal with this since the day that they were born? We like to sometimes think about the problem of, of self-driving cars as something like a trolley problem. Okay, you know, what if the car has to make a choice between saving the driver and hitting this, you know, pedestrian? What is it going to do? Or what if the pedestrian is going to, you know, has a baby stroller? Or what if the pedestrian is a, a Nobel laureate? All of these things, these aren't actually interesting problems to solve in this domain. They're nice because we can think of them as something that has a solution that we can sort of treat as a mind puzzle or a thought experiment, something we can like throw some category theory at. Um, but the truth is the trolley problem wasn't even a problem for trolleys. Um, the truth is that if we want to look at the real problems of self-driving cars, it comes to how we engineer them to begin with. So this is, comes to a point where we have to talk about quality, and I apologize if you're squicked out by raw meat. But this is a video that I made a few years ago, and I'm going to show you to, to play this briefly. Whoops. Try that again. So here we have a real live chicken breast. As you can see, there is no chicken attached to this chicken breast, but we have a heart rate of 119 beats per minute. Thank you very much, Microsoft Smartwatch for being an accurate fitness tracker. I have a lot of confidence in you now. So when we think about the quality of how we build engineered systems, we talk about lots of things around code quality, right? We, we know what good code is, right? Or maybe we don't know what good code is, but we know what bad code is. And, you know, some of you, um, maybe you've worked with a thought work and we love to talk about quality of code and agile and all of these things that we do in DevOps and continuous integration. Um, but when it comes to a physical system, quality has a different meaning. Quality means something. It means that you have some sort of guarantee about the safety and the efficacy of this device. And it's interesting that we can pull a heart rate off of a piece of raw chicken breast because it shows to some extent, oh, okay, maybe this type of device isn't of an appropriate quality. And this is a Microsoft smart band from a few years ago, and certainly some of the newer technology is better. But this device used what is called a photoplethysmography sensor. It's a green light that shines in your skin, and it reflects back, and it reads the color of your blood. And that's how it computes your heart rate. And so this is interesting, and maybe it's a bit of an edge case, but then things get a little bit weird. Because right around the time that I made this video, whoops, I don't need to watch that again. Right around the time I made this video, there is another thing happening with a similar device. This one was a Fitbit, but it used the same core technology 
of photoplethysmography sensors. A woman in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, filed a claim with police, a complaint, that one of her colleagues, her superior, had sexually assaulted her at an after-work event at his house. When police investigated her claim, they found a Fitbit in the hallway, and with her consent, they accessed the data. Based on the data that they pulled from that device, they came to the conclusion that the assault did not happen, and in fact, they charged her with a crime of lying to police, of which she was convicted. I can pull 120 beats per minute off of a piece of raw chicken, and we're letting these devices testify as expert witnesses, ruining somebody's life for a crime that goes unreported 95% of the time anyways? I don't think that that's right. This is not the first time that this has happened. If we look at the types of technology that we're building and the ways in which we're using them, there's a number of incidents of police looking for smart home recordings or you know, um, cameras from our smart doorbells, or in one case, a smart water meter used as evidence in a murder investigation. What? This is deeply concerning. Those are not the only headlines that we have to worry about. When we look at the Internet of Things, if we want to talk about software quality, we can't avoid software security as a core component, but it is not the only component. In 2016, DNS was taken down around the world. About a third of the Internet went down. Maybe you remember it because it was awesome because GitHub was down, Slack was down, and it was just like, cool, I'm going to not do any work. But it had serious implications because we now live in a world, and we lived in a world in 2016, where core services depend on the internet, emergency call centers, hospitals, banks, things like that, all rely on the internet. And this attack happened because the Mirai botnet was able to use cameras to launch the largest DDoS attack ever recorded in history. This type of capability has now been exploited by state actors to engage in cyber warfare against enemy nations. Internet of Things is not the only indictment here. We can look at social media as something. This is a headline from just a few days ago. In the United States, a Hispanic man, young Hispanic man, who was up for a visa renewal under the laws of our country, was arrested and deported because of an opinion he shared on Twitter. This impact has become noticeable by many, including the American politician Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Now, I want to play a couple clips from this. This is her questioning, maybe you've seen this, of Mark Zuckerberg a few days ago, or about a week ago, um, in the United States House of Representatives. And I just want you to watch what she's asking and how he's responding. Ms. Ocasio. I think you of all people can appreciate using a person's past behavior in order to determine, predict, or make decisions about future behavior. And in order for us to make decisions about Libra, I think we need to kind of dig into your past behavior and Facebook's past behavior with respect to our democracy. Uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, what year and month did you personally first become aware of Cambridge Analytica? Uh, I'm not I'm not sure of the exact time, but it was probably around the time when it became public. I think it was around March of 2018. I, I could be wrong, though. Mm -hmm. When did Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg become aware of Cambridge Analytica? I, I don't know off the top of my you head. You don't know. Um, did anyone on your leadership team know about Cambridge Analytica prior to the initial report by The Guardian on December 11, 2015? Uh, Congresswoman. I, I believe so, and that some folks were, were uh, tracking it internally. And you know, I, I'm actually, as you're asking this, I, I, I do think I, I was aware of Cambridge Analytica as an entity earlier. Mm -hmm. I just, I, I don't know if I was tracking how they were using Facebook specifically. When was the issue board. discussed with your board member, Peter Thiel? Uh, Congresswoman, I don't, I don't know that often. You don't know. This was the largest data scandal with respect to your company that had catastrophic impacts on the 2016 election. You don't, you don't know. Well, Congresswoman, I'm sure. 
that's not the only bit, but yes. So when we think about technological excellence, we can look at Facebook as one of the big technology companies, right? It's, if you can get Facebook on your resume, you're set in this, in this industry basically for the rest of your career. And here they are having catastrophic impacts on elections, as she said, and there's no interest in that accountability. Um, and so when we look at something like Facebook, we can think of it as saying, okay, well, I'm just using React, or I'm just using it to connect to my friends. I don't want it to be political. But we can't remove the politics from that, because as Langdon Winner says, there are some systems that are intractably or inseparable from the, polit from the politics of the uh, systems that they imbue. And I want to play the second part of this clip uh, a little bit later, to, which I is think is also very important. Let's jump ahead to about yeah. character for themselves. So you won't take, you may flag that it's wrong, but you won't take it down. Uh, Congresswoman, it's, uh, it, it depends on the context that it shows up. Organic post adds, okay. the, the treatment is a little One different. question, one more question. In your ongoing dinner parties with far-right figures, some of who advance the conspiracy theory that white supremacy is a hoax, did you discuss so-called social media bias against conservatives, and do you believe there is a bias? Uh, Congresswoman, um, so I don't remember everything that was in the, send in, in the question. That's all right. I'll move on. Can you explain why you've named The Daily Caller, a publication white, uh, well documented with ties to white supremacists as an official fact checker for Facebook? Congresswoman, sure. We actually don't appoint the independent fact checkers. They go through an independent organization called the Independent Fact Checking Network that has a rigorous standard for who they allow to, uh, to serve as a fact checker. So you would say that white supremacist tied uh, publications meet a rigorous standard for fact checking? That last bit was a lie, by the way. Facebook does choose which publications get appointed to that fact checking body. The point here is not to um, beat up on Facebook because it's Facebook. The point here is that when you have something like Facebook that is inherently political, that is being run by somebody who is deliberately making political decisions as to how that organization is being run, and there is no structure with which to hold them accountable, then there is no way for us to use the technology that they are creating, putting out into the world, without therefore also engaging in those politics ourselves. So you can make that conscious choice, and maybe you agree with those principles. That's okay. Um, but you can't say that you're not being political because, of, um, because you just don't want to engage in the politics. This is happening not just at Facebook, but elsewhere in the industry. I've beat up on Microsoft a little bit already, so I'll beat up on them again. Um, GitHub announced earlier this month that they will keep selling software to the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Division of the United States Department of Homeland Security, also known as the Baby Jail People. And what you can see here is uh, those silver things in the um, uh, photograph there are actually thermal blankets over children who are sleeping on the floor because we are building concentration camps and not even providing bedding for the people who are there who never even committed a crime. Um, this is a conscious decision. This contract was only for about $100,000. That is less than it costs to hire a single junior engineer in San Francisco. So this is a conscious decision by GitHub's leadership to engage with and support this behavior on behalf of a state. Microsoft, their parent company now, uh, just announced that they beat Amazon. Of course, we've got the two companies competing for who gets to build the cloud that makes the bombs more efficient that blow up your many funerals. Again, this is a conscious decision. They went out and bid and competed for this work, for this money. Go back to Facebook. Article from the BBC from three or four days ago. BBC investigation found that Instagram was being used as a slave market in Kuwait and other nations so that women and immigrants could be sold and bought for things like uh, household labor and other unsavory means. So our platforms, the things that we are building, are being used as slave markets today. This is happening. There is promise. 
there are things that we can do. If we go back to winter, he talks about this second type of technology, the ones that are, the intractable properties are unavoidably linked to particular institutionalized patterns of power and authority. And what he says of them is that there are no alternative, when there are no al alternative physical designs or arrangements that would make a, p a significant difference, there are f and there are furthermore no genuine possibilities for creative intervention by different social systems, capitalist or socialist, that could change the intractability of the entity or significantly alter the quality of pol its political effects. So we're not talking here about economics or government. What we are talking about here is the relationship, of course, to power. So if we don't understand, if we try to understand this from a business perspective without understanding this from a power perspective, we will fail and we will not solve these problems. For this reason, I don't talk about ethics anymore. Because sometimes we think of these things, we look at the wrongs, and there's lots of talks. Um, every conference you will find somebody talking about ethics, I, you know, maybe saying like, oh, what we need is an ethical code for computer scientists. I no longer believe that to be true. Maybe 15 years ago that was true. Because what ha will happen is, unless the ethical system will interrupt the flow of capital, which it will not, what we end up doing is creating a set of ethical rules that instead absolves us of our sins. Facebook itself did this in 2016 in response to um, some revelations that they were engaging in psychological research by seeing if they could alter the user's timeline to induce different psychological states to make them happier, sadder, angrier. They went and they looked at the ethics of what they were doing. And what they did is they chose to reject something known as the common rule. They say, we at Facebook found that the common rule framework does not fully meet our research needs. This was published in a paper in the Washington and Lee Review of Law in 2016. Now, the common rule is a United States law that says that medical research must be governed and regulated by an institutional review board, an independent body that reviews the, st the study setup, the um, objectives, the methods, etc and evaluates them for the three core principles of medical research ethics. Those three core principles are beneficence, justice, and respect for persons. Common, the common rule was descended from the Belmont Report. If you don't know what the Belmont Report is, it was a report commissioned in the 1970s in response to the Tuskegee experiments. Do you, does anyone know what the Tuskegee syphilis experiments were? Okay, a few people. If you don't know, the Tuskegee syphilis experiments were when the United States Army went around and took a bunch of um, black people from the local communities around Tuskegee and um, lied to them and then injected them, them with syphilis and ran um, experimental treatments on them, sterilizing many of the women um, in an act of ethnic cleansing. The report was designed to prevent this type of behavior. Facebook said, we don't need to worry about that. We're not doing anything that's going to, I don't know, alter the course of the world or anything like that. Um, and they said, we're going to use something called the Menlo Report. Now, the Menlo Report was designed by the United States Department of Homeland Security, specifically for the technology industry, to, faci to facilitate the research of things that truly don't have that much of an impact, like A-B testing. What if we put the button here or here? What if the button is blue versus red? What if, you know, those types of things. So there's an irony that in rejecting a report that was created in response to a government agency doing something horrible and racist, they instead chose to, again, use a report created by a government agency that is currently doing something horrible and racist. So we see this pattern here, again, over and over and over. Institutionalized patterns of power and authority. In any case, if we want to think about ethics, we can think about the trolley problem, which does actually have a solution. It's called a transit strike. It's the ability to remove the conditions through which the bad act can be done. If the trolleys can't run, you don't have to ever choose which lever. Uh, you don't ever have to pull the lever to choose which track it goes down. So if we want to think about power, if we want to think about the patterns of institutionalized power and authority, we have to think about inverting them if we want to stop the bad acts from being done. And one of the ways that we can invert them is through our roles as developers and engineers. 
When I gave this talk, or a version of this talk, a few years ago in Berlin at JSConf, um, I made some people really angry. I'm probably making some people really angry in the audience right now. And somebody tweeted at me, um, I worked at Fitbit for four years. Your statements about Fitbit in your uh, talk felt slanderous. Uh, people there cared a lot and thought deeply about ethics, and I don't disagree with that at all. I know that they did. I know people at Fitbit. Um, it's not about what they thought about, it's about what they did. And in this case, what they didn't do. Because when the Fitbit case um, was going through the courts in Pennsylvania, nobody from Fitbit came, stood up and said, no, 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 you can't use our device as an expert witness, that's not right. They're not accurate enough. And so this woman has a criminal record, but what's happened in the past couple of years, a number of lawsuits have been filed against Fitbit, arguing that they're inaccurate. And in fact, one class action lawsuit has been settled, and if you've bought a Fitbit, you can sign on to this class action lawsuit, you'll get $12.50 back. In response to some of these things, people are talking. People in positions with major uh, audiences are starting to talk about what it means. So we should care about this as developers. If you don't care about these things, you should, because there are people with extremely large platforms talking about breaking up your company, breaking up the, the vehicles that you use to get funding, to get attention, to get all of these things. We're talking about nationalizing Facebook, Google, and Amazon, or breaking up Facebook, or regulating Facebook. Um, and there's a few different solutions. In fact, I can count five different solutions to the problem. Um, and it's ironic that this is the order from difficult to, or from easy to difficult. Um, regulation would be the easiest, and my friend Siva says that it would, it would be one of the greatest challenges in human history. And I'll remind you that we have been to the freaking moon. We can regulate them. We can do something a little bit stronger. So we can legislate against them. We can create laws that have criminal penalties rather than just civil penalties. We can nationalize them. That's a challenge, um, because which nation? Not the baby jail nation, not the one that I'm from, right? I don't live there anymore. I now live in Germany. I don't also trust Germany. So which nation is going to do it? I don't know. We could demonopolize them. We could certainly break them up, um, break them up break Facebook back into Instagram and WhatsApp or whatever, that also won't work, or we could revolt. And the thing is, <laughs> it's not on us to choose whether that revolution happens. We can either choose to start acting with ethics, or we can wait for the revolution to happen to force us to. So there's other ways to have that revolution, and that is a revolution from us using our worker power to stop these things before they can start. And there's a list of this. This is something, this is a website if you're interested. Um, it's a little small here. Um, of collective actions in tech that have been happening over the past couple of years. Um, this website, it's just a beautifully simple list of things that are happening in the industry where people are organizing to take power back and exert control over their companies from the inside. Um, so I think it's just uh, collectiveactions.tech, but there's a QR code I'll leave up for a minute here um, so that you can look at it if you'd like. Most of the tech companies are facing some sort of backlash for this now. There is a movement within GitHub to oppose that contract. At least one person has resigned publicly over it. There's movements inside Amazon for better working conditions in their warehouses. There's discussions. The Google walkout one year anniversary was just a few days ago. Um, one of my very good friends was one of the major contributors to that movement. We can do more. We maybe should do more, but I'll let that be up to you to decide. I care about these things not just because I, you know, perhaps it's a mea culpa from working in the defense industry for eight years, but I care about these things because I have seen firsthand what they can do to our world. Because when Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was questioning Mark Zuckerberg about white supremacist media on Facebook, that is something that rang very close to home for me, literally. Because I'm from a place that is in one of the most beautiful places in the world, in my opinion, the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. And this area is an area with deep history. 
I came from, before I moved to Berlin, I came from a place that was on stolen Monacan land in an area with the oldest mountains in the world, a place of commensurate beauty and a deep history of exploitation. In the early 20th century, a number of movements of coal miners, steel workers, railroad workers started striking because of the working conditions. They were brutal working conditions. They were working six days, seven days a week, 16 hours a day, going down into mines. Not that we do anything like that. I mean, we all work eight hours a day, five days a week, and then, you know, contribute to open source, which is necessary to progress in our careers, but we'll just, you know, leave that aside for a moment. Those strikes were brutally crushed. These are United States troops that were deployed to Harlan County. This is called the Harlan County Wars. People died, there were gunfights. And it's relevant because if, we, if you've heard the phrase that data is the new oil, you might also know that oil was the new coal. And so if what we are doing is mining data, then we can look to how the people who mined coal started fighting back when their superiors were starting to use their power in exploitative ways. So if you can agree that data is the new oil and that oil is, was the new coal, and if you can agree that what we are doing is mining data to extract wealth and profit, then you might also be able to agree that despite our high salaries in this industry, we are not middle class. There is no such thing as a middle class. There is a working class and there is an owner class. And so we have that same power. But this connection was meaningful to me, not just because of that, because the actual place that I was from is a place called Charlottesville, Virginia. And if you have heard that name, if you don't know it, um, it's famous for all the wrong reasons. And so when we talk about the white supremacist literature that's being spread on Facebook, it was also a platform that was used to foment the largest neo-Nazi rally in North America in almost four decades. And this happened in my home, and I am in this picture as one of the people that's being surrounded. And I'm in fact in this picture right here in the striped shirt when a terrorist attack happened, prompted by a white supremacist who shared memes on Twitter and Instagram in the months leading up to the attack about how he was planning on running down protesters with a car and then did exactly that, killing somebody. And so I think a lot about whether or not we are on the right side of history when we look at the abuses that are happening with the tech industry and the ways that which we are failing to hold the industry accountable. And I look at my own role as a data scientist. What am I supposed to do? How can I be contributing when I am building machine learning algorithms and building technology that is accelerating this problem? And I can't look at you and say, yeah, I'm on the right side of history. And I say that as somebody who literally ran at the terrorist when he attacked us. And so I'll leave you with this note, and I've preached for a bit, and I thank you for letting me preach for a bit, that we have a lot of power in the industry to make this into something good. The industry is about building bridges. It is about connecting people. It is about doing the cool shit that we all love, because I'm like you. I love listening to these talks. I love hearing people talking about full-stack development and F-sharp and building AR with AI and doing test-driven development. I love these things. I want to do those things. I want to care about something more than that, but I can't also do those things while I know that we're also building the platforms that white supremacists are using to come into my communities and commit terror attacks and kill people and harm friends of mine. So my ask of you, my call to action, is that I want you to build bridges, but please just don't build them too low. Thank you very much.